Actually, picking up from where you were saying, because it's not just sort of now. I mean, I'm sure that 90% of people in this audience will now wash their hands for 20 seconds uh, for a couple of days and then stop. And there's, it's, but it's got something you, you've, made, you've made it clear at the end, you've got to sort of continue this. And that's, that's the hard thing. You can get enthusiasm for a short period of time, but you just sort of keep on going. And I'm not quite sure how you sort of can manage to persuade people that in a year's time, 90% of the audience should still be washing their hands for 20 seconds. Um, what we find is that when people encounter nasty infections, they begin to really change their behaviours. But, of course, what we need to move into is nudge. Um, so the classic story is the urinals at Schiphol, where men splashed everywhere until they put in the urinal a little bee on the wall above the urinal, and the men aimed at that, and it was all much cleaner. We will have to find the equivalents of those to help people. We've got to both incentivise the pharmaceutical companies to make new and better drugs, but we have to nudge all of us into doing the right thing. And maybe we'll find better soaps or something. I, I had wondered what those things were doing in Skip, I have to say. Uh, right, I've uh, not seen them. No. <laughs> OK, uh, please, yes. Go wait for the microphone to come. Hi, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, do you know all those gels that are around? And you know, and I've um, I've seen some articles that basically have said that they actually don't work as well as as um, has been advertised. So I just wanted to get your opinion on those. Um, I have a very straightforward answer. There's nothing as good as soap and water used properly. Uh, and there is increasing evidence that many of the bacteria are finding ways of resistance to those antibacterial wipes and gels. So some will work, but not on all, and all bacteria. Soap and water, old-fashioned, it works. Please. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, so it seems that a large part of the problem is due to antibiotics being used for animals. So if everyone just became vegetarian, that would not only solve this problem, but it would also go a long way towards solving global warming. So why are scientists so hesitant to recommend that? Um, well, I would argue as a hematologist that we need some animal protein or you'll end up with some quite interesting diseases and, and anemias. Um, it's not for me to tell people uh, which sort of diet they should eat, but what we do need is to make sure that we protect people from unnecessary antibiotic use. And actually, as your chief medical officer, I can also tell you that in general, people overeat red meat and it increases their risk of cancer. So there are other reasons for reducing our use of meat as well as making sure it is more effectively produced. Please. Um, thank you, that's very interesting. Um, I, I spent the last 15 years raising children, and I was told when I started that we were supposed to let our children get exposed to bacteria so that they would grow up with healthy immune systems. And I picked up some of the stuff you were telling me is now that I should be sterilizing myself to make sure I don't give them bad <laughs> diseases. Um, if, if I have another child, what should I be doing better next time? <laughs> You do not want your children to be too clean. It's not good for their immune system and their diseases later. But, you know, there's a difference between being a, a, a healthy child messing around and preparing your food stuff properly or not washing your hands after you've been and defecated. I mean, that's filth. The other is mess. Okay, somebody, yes, Blair. Is anybody in the gallery, by the way? <laughs> okay. You said that where we should start is that GPs should um, not give in to patients asking for antibiotics, but surely the GP can say no, don't take it. It's a very difficult interaction between a doctor and a patient, and yeah. I've never blamed GPs when you've got um, to cope with someone who's ill, a mother with a sick child, 
and we have no definitive test there and there, there and then, to say, huh, I really won't give it to you because what happens if they get it wrong? Which they very rarely would or do. What we really need is much more common sense and resilience in the population and a rapid diagnostic. And I don't know whether you noticed, but a couple of years ago, the government launched a prize called the Longitude Prize to celebrate 300 years of the original Longitude Prize. And BBC ran a big open science question. What was the thing, that the, the subject that the Longitude Prize should be for? And it's actually for a rapid diagnostic con to contribute to reducing AMR. So I'm hopeful that with that prize and then the Americans have followed suit and the Europeans have followed suit with their own prizes, we may end up with some effective rapid diagnostics. Okay, uh, there. Please, Martin, just up and to the... You showed on one of your graphs that one of the problems is that uh, the antibiotics weren't a financial success for the drug companies, and in fact, any new ones will be even less of a success for obvious reasons, because they won't be used very much. So is there any initiative for government to finance a development of new antibiot antibiotics so that there'll be a cupboard of medicines yes. locked away for emergencies, etc.? That, that's absolutely right. The conundrum is... First, that if they make an antibiotic, I, as the chief medical officer, want to lock it up and only use it as a last resort to save lives. Um, the second issue is, of course, that generally people rarely take antibiotics, and they might take them for a week at a time, and they're pretty cheap compared with cancer drugs or something. And so compared with things like statins or tablets for high blood pressure or diabetes, where people take them every day for the rest of their lives, the profits, well, there aren't any. Uh, so one of the things that we asked Lord O'Neill to look at in his independent review was how to sort this. And he and a number of other pieces of work that happened to be going along at the same time have all come up and said we have to what they call de-link the costs of doing the research from actually selling them and, make, and getting them to patients. So that then leads you to how do you fund the research so that you can restrict them and not have it a profit-driven um, system thereafter. He, uh, Jim O'Neill, came up with a, a very clever idea called market entry rewards um, where the drug companies either had to spend money on developing new antibiotics or pay a levy into a fund that would fund others to do it. That hasn't quite caught on everywhere. Other people are coming up with different models. And at the G20, we from Britain, with support from South Africa in particular, got it on the agenda of both the finance ministers and then the heads of state. And um, Chancellor Merkel who is the chair of the G20 next year, has remitted it to two financial organisations, OECD and World Bank, and the World Health Organisation, to come back next year to her G20 meeting with some solutions. That was a long-winded way of saying, this is so complex, the best brains in the world are busy working on it, and I hope we'll have some answers that governments can sign up to in a year. In the, in the front, Martin. Okay, right. So, fun for then up here. Okay. Uh, let, let. I've read that he advised before about washing your hands for 20 seconds, but they put equal importance on using warm water. Do you not think it's important whether you use warm water or cold water? Uh, I think it's much better to use hot water, but it, it wasn't going to work here, I'm afraid. We debated thermos flasks, but went for simplicity. Hi, thanks for your clarity to such a subject which I mean, personally it affects me a lot. With 20% lung function, I'm, I'm reliant on antibiotics. And you flash the two up um, as azithromycin. I must take Wednesdays, Mondays, sorry, Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays every week. I'm supposed to take those to keep off any infection that might come. And when I do get uh, pneumonia or whatever, um, it's the ciprofloxacin, which is my... Ah, that's still in the cupboard, you know, I've sort of kept it. But 
really the point I'd like to make is a political one. Um, I live a lot of the time in Egypt. In 2009, the swine flu epidemic was at, at large. So the Egyptian government ordered that the Egyptian people slaughter every single pig in the country. Now, that's a second world country, and that is the medical advice from the government. What hope is there for governments worldwide to be persuaded and educated and, and to, 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 to help with best, best practice? Thank you. Well, I am hopeful. Uh, I think that over the last three years, we've come on a long journey about needing new antibiotics, protecting the ones we've got, in order that people like you will have access when you need them. It's still a journey to go. Think how long it took to get to where we are on climate change, and there's defaulting all around. But there's now an acceptance, both for climate change and AMR, that the world has to move forward. So I'm hopeful. But it's going to be a long haul. It's not an easy one. But the UK will keep at it. I promise you that. OK, two more, I think. Uh, a bit further up. What is the state of uh, research into new antibiotics in British universities at the moment? Not brilliant. Um, it's quite interesting that um, the world's pharma companies in general disinvested in this area. GSK has a bit. AZ has, well, has some. AZ has a bit and it's just sold it to Merck. Um, but in... Hospitals and medical schools, we've disinvested in this whole area. It wasn't sexy. So we're having to rebuild um, those areas and broaden them. But the Medical Research Council, the research councils, have AMR as one of their big grand challenges and are going to um, be funding a lot more work. They've started. The Gates Foundation is looking at it. The Wellcome Trust is. So I think it's going to... Well, I can tell you, it will improve. <laughs> <laughs> right, one last question. Yeah. Um, thank you for your talk. And I was wondering how exactly the um, people who make new antibiotics um, come up with them and what, how they um, kill the bacteria but not the cells. And also um, what makes different classes different and why this is... Ooh. <laughs> 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 you know... If I knew all of that, I probably wouldn't be standing here because they're very difficult. But let me explain that there are different ways you can um, kill bacteria. You can kill them because you, you damage the pumps in the membrane so that they swell up and pop. You can kill them because you damage their DNA so they can't multiply. You, so there are many different ways. The problem is when we've tried um, using either gen a, a genomic approach or a synthetic small molecule approach, they haven't found new antibiotics. All the successful antibiotics are, have, are complex molecules that attack bacteria in more than one way. They actually have two cell walls, the gram negatives, which makes it even more complicated. You might breach the first and the inner one still works. So we're now starting to look much more at natural products, try and find natural antibiotics one of the most exciting programs is a German program I was shown where they're looking at insects because insects live with all these infections and they don't get them and finding what they secrete and use to prevent infection, learning from those and then you manipulate those to get antibiotics to use in humans. But it's really complex and I wish I knew all that you've asked. I think with that, we need to draw to a close. And so it just remains for me to thank Dame Sally enormously for a lecture that might be slightly pessimistic, but it does illustrate the very close links between science, society, and culture, which is one of the things that our is about. So thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>